Hi, everyone. Welcome to our seminar. We'll get started in just uh, a few seconds. Just let everybody file into the, to the Zoom room. All right, let's get rolling. So, um, hi everyone, welcome um, back again, or welcome for the first time. If this is your first uh, Berman Institute uh, seminar. Uh, so we're uh, delighted to have a colleague of ours today uh, from the NIH, who will introduce in a moment, but let me just do uh, the usual sort of ground rules and um, expectations for the seminar. So we'll have about 45 minutes or so of presentation followed by a question and answer um, discussion. You're welcome to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll take them in order of appearance. Um, if you do wanna raise a, a, a point verbally or you're welcome to, you can just raise your hand, use a hand raise function and we'll, um, we'll also take questions or comments that way. Um, I I think that's about it, um, other than the usual things. So let me um, now just introduce our speaker. And apologies, I just closed my window. So let me reopen that again. All right. So we have today with us, um, as I mentioned, a, a dear colleague from the NIH Department of Bioethics, Dr. David Wendler, who's written um, widely on a number of different topics and issues, some of the most um, challenging issues, I'll say, in, in research ethics at times, which includes issues involving assent in pediatric research, uh, assessing research risks uh, systematically, uh, research involving stored biological samples and the ethical and governance issues around that, um, as well as, as a number of different dimensions of, um, of research uh, when it, in, in, in relation to issues of exploitation in communities and in other settings. Um, Dr. Wendler has been attending on the Bioethics Con Consultation Service at the NIH for uh, a long time now and as a member, serves as a member of the NIH Intramural IRB. He's consulted uh, on a number of different issues, including issues of minimal risk with the Secretary's Advisory Commission on Human Research Protections, or affectionately um, known as the Committee uh, of SACARP, um, which somehow works as an acronym. I'm not sure how, but it does. Um, and has uh, consulted also with uh, the Division of AIDS on, at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease at the NIH on uh, issues involving research and ethics. Um, he's also been a visiting scholar at the University of Virginia. He's lectured at the University of Bergen School of Medicine in Norway, Georgetown University, and University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, he's earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Pennsylvania and master's and doctoral degrees at the University of Wisconsin at Madison and came to the NIH in 1993 as a postdoc and clearly um, they didn't want to lose him. So hang on to him um, and he's... Uh, been there, including at Harvard University for a short while. Um, and we're really delighted again, Dave, to have you here today um, to uh, hear a bit more about your current work on the issues involving ethics and surrogate decision making. So thanks very much, Dave, and uh, over to you. Thanks, Joe, for that introduction. It was all true, except one, one mistake. The, uh, they didn't want to get rid of me. I think they couldn't figure out how to get rid of me and are still working on that. <laughs> I see. A long time going. So I want to make sure that everybody can see my screen here. So I'm going to, let's see if this goes well. So hopefully I'm sharing now. And then I'm going to go to the slideshow. Does that look okay, Joe? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. All right. So thanks for having me. It's nice. It's great to be here. Unfortunately, we can't do it in person. Um, but this is certainly, hopefully better than nothing. So as Joe mentioned, I'm going to talk about the ethics of surrogate decision making. And for the most part, I'm going to think about decision making within the context of medical care or clinical treatment. Could also talk about that with respect to research participation if anybody is interested. So what I'm going to try to do in this talk is just give an overview of what I see as the current state of surrogate decision making for patients. And as you'll hear, I think the current state is unfortunately at least somewhat dismal, and I think we need to try to figure out ways to do better. And I'm going to try to describe some things some people have tried and some things we're trying. 
and then also discuss some things that I think clinicians and other relevant people can do in the meantime. And in order to set the stage for that, I think it's helpful to figure out ways to improve surrogate decision making. It's important to first understand what we take to be the important goals that we're trying to achieve with surrogate decision making. So I'm going to start there with just, I'm John Mitchell, I'm a philosopher, so I get to give you a little bit of philosophy, although hopefully it won't be too much. But I think that's important for understanding where we are with surrogate decision making and what we're going to need to do if we're going to do better. Okay, so just a little bit of brief, brief background here. So the way I think about decisional capacity refers to an ability that individuals have to make decisions. And it's a specific decision. People in the field call this task specificity, that you can be capacitated to make some decisions, but not others. So for example, we could just think here about the decision of whether or not to undergo surgery, or as I mentioned, we could talk about research, for instance, decision whether or not to enroll in a clinical trial. And there are different views on this. I don't think it'll make a big difference for today, although we could talk about it if people have questions. There are slightly different views on exactly what's required to have decisional capacity within the clinical setting. But here's a standard view. You have to understand the material facts. Some people also distinguish appreciation of those facts from understanding. You have to be able to reason about them in light of your own values, preferences, views of how you want your life to go. You have to make a voluntary choice that's at least sufficiently free from undue influence or coercion of others. And then you have to be able to communicate that choice in one way or another to the relevant clinicians. So as people know, the last 30, 40 years, there's been a lot of emphasis on patient autonomy and respect for patient autonomy. That's very important, but What's critical to note, and I don't think is always noted to the extent it should be, is that many adults, many adult patients lack decisional capacity at the time decisions need to be made. There are estimates that up to 70% of older adults, adults over 65 lack decisional capacity. It's also probably the case, although we don't have firm data on this, that decisions at the end of life, the vast majority of them, 80, 90% are probably made by somebody other than the patient themselves. These are really critical decisions. And so I think it's important for us to understand how we're making them and to see how well we're doing and ways we might be able to do better. So for patients who don't have decisional capacity, they lack one of those necessary abilities I mentioned a minute ago. We need someone else, what I'm going to refer to as a surrogate, sometimes also called a DPA or a durable power of attorney, to make decisions for them. So people might know the recent literature and discussions on supported decision making. I'm not going to talk about that, but we can if people are interested. So I'm going to assume there is a threshold below which people can't make decisions for themselves and that those people, those individuals need a surrogate to help make decisions for them. Some people filled out an advanced directive or a DPA while they were capacitated and they assigned a surrogate themselves. Other people who have not done this may retain the capacity to do so. So the fact that a person can't make a treatment decision doesn't mean this is the point of task specificity I mentioned a minute ago, they may be able to retain the capacity to assign a surrogate. This is a nice paper on this from my colleague, Scott Kim, for people who are interested. And if somebody doesn't have decisional capacity, hasn't previously assigned a surrogate, doesn't have the capacity to do it now, then there are legal standards. States have legal hierarchies for who the next of kin surrogate will be. And for people who don't have an available next of kin, the courts will assign a surrogate or a legal guardian for them. Okay, so that's just the background. So now here's the little bit of philosophy to set the stage for what's going to come after this. And it's just a question of how should surrogates make decisions? So if we think about decision making as a mode of trying to respect the patient, then it's a question of what does respect require and how can we respect patients appropriately even after they lose the capacity to make their own decisions. So people are well aware of the efforts over the last 40 years of the US to encourage patients to complete advanced directives where they prospectively document what kinds of treatments they would or they wouldn't want in case they lose decisional capacity. 
So the idea here is that what this approach does, it promotes what philosophers call liberty or some people call sovereignty. The idea is that it provides a means for patients to control how they're treated even after they lose decisional capacity by prospectively documenting how they will and will not want to be treated. And sometimes, not as often as we'd like, patients actually do that in a written formal advanced directive. Or other times they might do it in more informal conversations. And in both cases, I consider those a kind of advanced directive. It's the capacitated patient directing how they should be treated at the time at which they lose decisional capacity. Another thing that's important to note is that you can lose the capacity to make decisions by losing one of the necessary capacities. So for instance, I might lose the capacity to understand the risks of surgery or the alternatives to surgery, but that doesn't mean I've lost all of the relevant capacities. So in particular, after people lose decisional capacity, they often retain their values for some period of time. Here's another nice paper from my colleague, Scott Kim. And as a previous fellow of ours, Agnieszka Jaworska pointed out, even after some people lose decisional capacity, they lose, they still retain what she calls the capacity to value, the capacity to have certain values, certain fundamental commitments. And in these cases, when we have clear documentation or we're able to get from the patient their current preferences, what surrogates should be doing in making decisions is they should try to make decisions based on those values of the patient themselves. And we can talk about this in terms of promoting what some people call authenticity, the idea that it's important in respecting patients to treat them and have their lives go according to their own values. And in this regard, surrogates can work with the patient if the patient's still able to communicate. They can encourage them to consider certain options over other ones, guide them in various ways to make the decision that is most in accord with their own values. But the important thing here to note, of course, is that the decision is supposed to be based on the values of the patient, not based on the values of the surrogate. So many patients don't indicate their treatment preferences in advance. And moreover, current discussion doesn't elicit the ref relevant values. You could just imagine if you want an example here to think about, just think of somebody who comes into an ER who's been involved in a motor vehicle accident and has a closed headed injury and is unconscious. So they don't have an advanced directive. We can't talk to them directly. So we have to figure out how are we gonna make decisions for them. So the standard, legal standard and also ethical standard is what widely known as substituted judgment, where the surrogate is supposed to try to make the decision or make the choice that the patient would have made for themselves in the circumstances. So this is a classic text for anybody who's interested in this. Still, I think maybe the best thing that's ever been written on this is by two philosophers, uh, Dan Brock and Alan Buchanan, called Deciding for Others about 30 years ago now. And I think this is both helpful, but as I'll say in a minute, there's ways in which I think it's problematic. So what they suggest to think about substituted judgment is to imagine, as they say, imagine we have our unconscious patient I just mentioned a moment ago. Well, imagine, hypothetically, this patient miraculously awakens for just a few moments and they understand everything and they get to make a decision. We're supposed to ask ourselves, and the surrogate is supposed to ask themselves, based on their knowledge of the patient, what decision would the patient, if that happened, make? And then the idea is the surrogate is just simply supposed to make that decision. So in this case, you can think of the surrogate acting as a kind of channel or a medium for the decision that the patient would make for themselves. So that's the way substitute judgment is often understood. There are a couple of problems with it. First, going back to the values I mentioned previously, making a decision that the patient would have, but did not in fact make, doesn't promote control over their lives. They're not in control of it because they're not making the decision and they didn't indicate that's the decision that we should make for them. So we're not promoting liberty or sovereignty through this mechanism. Also, it's important to note that there could be various ways in which the patient wouldn't want us to make the decision that they would make for themselves. And we can talk about this 
later on if people are interested. I think there are a number of interesting examples here. So those are two, I think, primary concerns with understanding substituted judgment in the way it's often understood. So what should we do in response? So my proposal is that we should think about substituted judgment, not literally, don't take it literally, but instead think of it as a heuristic with the idea that imagining the decision that the patient would make for themselves provides a way of thinking what decision in these circumstances will best promote authenticity which decision best accords with the patient's own value. So with a previous fellow of ours, John Phillips, we wrote a paper on this. We called this the endorsed life approach, where the idea is one way to talk to surrogates to say, make whatever decision you think best continues the life that the patient endorsed for themselves. Now, of course, there are going to be cases where that's not even clear. So they didn't fill out an advanced directive. They can't tell you their values now. It's not clear what decision best continues their life they endorsed. And so in that case, to the extent that this is clear, what the surrogate should then do is try to make the decision that best is in the clinical interest of the patient. This obviously is just an attempt to promote the best interests of the patient to the extent possible. Okay, so that's the background. And then that background is supposed to put us in a position to ask the following question. How well do current approaches work? How well does current practice with respect to surrogate decision-making actually promote these goals that I mentioned, liberty or sovereignty, and also authenticity, and then the best interests of the patients when neither of those are known or attainable? This is a survey we did a couple years ago with a then fellow Annette Ridd, who's now one of my colleagues in our department. And we didn't want to just do it based on the philosophical considerations I mentioned before. We thought, okay, let's figure out first, let's get a clear sense for what patients want. What are their goals for decision making in cases that they lose decisional capacity? I don't think these are surprising here, but worth going through about 40% want to be treated based on their own preferences. So it really is what patients want a lot is being treated the way they want to be treated and not treated in ways they don't want to be treated. Also about a fifth want to minimize the burden on their surrogates and their family. 15% uh, want to have family to be involved and about 25% couldn't choose. They basically thought for the most part that the first two were equally important. They both want to be treated based on their preferences and also want to minimize the burden on their family or surrogate. So really those first two are the primary ones in terms of patient goals. The majority of patients wanna be treated based on their own preferences and also they wanna minimize the burden on their surrogate, their family and their loved ones. Okay, so how well are we attaining these? Turns out unfortunately from what we know and the data we have now, not very well. So first problem is what we call predictive accuracy, or in this case, you might call it predictive inaccuracy. Surrogates, it turns out, often just aren't able to predict or guess which treatment the patient would choose for themselves. And the data suggests, and we could talk more about this data and how these results will come up if people are interested. But basically, the conclusion of a long list of studies is that when it's unclear which option is medically best for the patient. Surrogates are maybe, if you're optimistic and you squint a little bit when you look at the data, slightly more accurate than random guessing. So if you take a dichotomous choice between having surgery or not having surgery, being intubated or not being intubated, where if you just flipped a coin, it's two options, so you get it right half the time. Surrogates are maybe a little bit better than that. So we're not getting much in terms of predictive accuracy, if anything, by relying on surrogates to make your decisions rather than flipping a coin. So why is that? So let's just mention a couple of points that we talk about this more. It turns out that we're just very bad as human beings at predicting the preferences and values of others. We're just bad at this in general. And it turns out we're especially bad. We're worse at it, predicting the preferences and values of people we love, people we're closest to. And of course, that's a problem because it's precisely those individuals that we rely on to make treatment decisions for them in the event of decisional incapacity. All the state laws that pick next of kin surrogates, they pick the closest one, not the furthest 
next of kin. And those are the ones who are especially bad at predicting our preferences and values. Why is that? A lot of things are going on probably. We project our preferences onto the patient. We think they want what we want, even when they don't. We know too much about them. So we're thinking about these circumstances we remember so much and that confuses us. We're also too involved in their lives. We're upset, they're sick, maybe they're dying. It's not an ideal situation for us to think clearly and make decisions for them. A couple of other things that are interesting is that we tend in general to make different kinds of decisions and view other people differently. So for instance, we tend to be more risk averse according to this study when we're making decisions for others. We might take a chance for ourselves, take big risks for ourselves, but we're very reluctant to do that when making decisions for other people. Another interesting one, this is consistent with a lot of data we know about how we evaluate the states of other people, is that if you look at somebody who's very sick, if you look at somebody who's an intensive care unit who might be intubated, surrogates tend to significantly overestimate how bad that experience is for the patients themselves, and that can incline them to be more interested in removing support even when maybe it's doing something effective. So a number of different sources for surrogate inaccuracy. The point here is that it's probably going to be hard with just training, and I'll give you some data to support this in a minute, it's going to be hard to correct this. It's going to be hard to get us to the point where we can do better about this on our own. Okay, so that was the first goal. Patients want to be treated based on their own preferences. We're not doing very well at that, the data suggests. Remember, the second goal was minimizing the burden on their family. So there's a lot of studies here which suggest that making treatment decisions specifically for incapacitated loved ones is stressful, it's anxiety provoking, it's traumatic. Many people feel terrible afterwards. And these negative effects, unfortunately, can last months and even in some cases, they can last years. So just a couple, actually very humbling examples here. I'll just give you a couple of them. So this is Tilden from 2001. Six months after making the decisions, the stress levels in the surrogate still exceeded the levels in people who had lost a home to fire. So people who know these data, losing your house to a fire is one of the most traumatic things that can happen to us. For surrogates, this was the same thing six months later. And then another one was years later, a large percentage of the surrogates felt guilty for the decisions they made. And when you think about the kind of decisions we're asking surrogates to make, it's not surprising. So do you wanna leave your loved one in an ICU on aggressive support, intubated? It's not a good experience. It can be a terrible experience. If we say yes, we feel like we're subjecting them to a lot of bad experiences. If the alternative is passing away, then by saying no, withdrawing the support, we feel responsible for bringing about their demise. Both terrible options and things people don't want and feel bad about being responsible for. So what we know or the data suggests now is that we're not doing a very good job at promoting patients' best interest. Can we do better? So there've been a number of studies um, I'll just go through a couple of these to uh, suggest where we are and then maybe where we can go. So as we know, although we've been encouraging patients to fill out advanced directives, we still have typically a minority of patients filling out advanced directives. So there've been several efforts in this regard. This was a prominent one from Wisconsin, it was called Respecting Choices, trying to get people into a much more integrated team approach to filling out, encouraging discussion, retrievable documentation of the patient's preferences. It did fairly well in terms of actual documentation. Whether or not it's scalable, <coughs> excuse me, might be a different question. Also, people might be familiar with Pulse and Mulse now are pretty widely available. And the idea here is the problem with advanced directives, A, people don't fill them out, but B, they're not medical orders. They're just kind of suggestions or evidence to take into account. Whereas if you fill out a Pulse or Mulse, that actually is itself a medical order and they can cover a range of treatments, CPR, dialysis, DNR, DNI, do not intubate. So there've been some efforts to try to do better at documenting and implementing patient's wishes to the extent that these get documentation um, and they clarify patient's goals. I think that could be valuable. I still think I'm at least somewhat skeptical about how much we're going to get out of these efforts 
for a simple fact that if you talk to most patients, the patients I talk to, they'll say things like this. Well, I want treatment in this scenario if it makes sense, if it's reasonable, if it might help me. And these are all wiggle words that we have to implement in the case. Well, what's reasonable and what's not reasonable? By might help, what kind of percentage chance? Any chance, 1%, 5% chance? What's artificially prolonging life? How long? And these are things that typically we have to make decisions at the time. So even if we document those kinds of preferences, we're still going to have hard decisions to make. Some other people have suggested, well, if the families are struggling with this, both in terms of predicting accurately and also the burden they experience, maybe we should go back to the days, at least to a certain extent, when clinicians made the decisions for decisionally incapacitated patients. So this is Horace DeLisa from Penn. A number of people have made uh, these recommendations. And there is some support for this in the fact that at least a substantial minority of patients, when you ask them, even capacitated patients, how do you want decisions to be made? They'll say, I want my clinicians to make decisions for them. So this isn't beyond the range of what at least a lot of patients want for themselves. So what are the concerns with this approach? Um, the concerns are the data, although there aren't that much data here, but the data that there do exist suggests that clinicians are actually even less able to predict what patients want than surrogates. And so if we start relying more on clinicians rather than surrogates, we may be decreasing the surrogate burden to a certain extent, although that's to be determined, but we might at the same time be decreasing predictive accuracy. So we might be trading off the one patient goal for the other patient goal. The other thing I worry about when I talk to people who take this approach is, well, what's the burden like for you to be making these life and death decisions for people you don't know? That's obviously a concern. And then of course, with clinicians, they do this every day, every week. To what extent does that burden accumulate? To what extent does it lead to stressed out clinicians? To what extent does it lead to burnout and dropout? Those would be really important concerns when we're talking about trained and experienced, say, intensivists. So some concerns with that approach. Another thing, this is what people in bioethics, I've always talked to when I do consultations with patients, I encourage this, although it turns out it may not actually really help, which is the idea we say, sit down with the person you're signing your surrogate and talk to them. Tell them what your preferences are, what kind of treatments you want, what kind of treatments you don't want. Well, some people, Canadian, who've been working on this did a real, what I thought was a really nice study. This is one of the only, I know, randomized studies on this, where they did a randomized test of facilitated discussions where the patient and the surrogate sat down together with a facilitator to discuss the patient's treatment preferences. It's a really nice effort, great idea. It's what I've been recommending to patients for a long time. Fortunately, the data suggests it just didn't make a difference. It didn't really change the extent to which the surrogates were able to predict what treatment the patient would want. That was too bad. There have been another kinds of decision aids that people have tried, more personalized prognostic estimates for the specific individual and also clarifying the patient's values. And unfortunately, this didn't improve predictive accuracy or reduce psychological distress either. Uh, another one was trying to focus, okay, let's focus on the, the burden part of it rather than the predictive accuracy part of it, trying to provide emotional part, uh, emotional support for the surrogates. And in this case, as we've seen in a couple other efforts trying to support surrogates a lot of times doesn't actually reduce their burden. And in fact, in some cases, as in this one, where post-traumatic stress actually increased or the symptoms of it did, we can actually make things worse. It's another example, Doug White's an intensivist at Pitt, who's one of the leading researchers in this area where they tried a randomized trial of family support and it didn't really uh, reduce the emotional burns on the surrogate. So where are we now? So this is a, a nice commentary by, by Doug and a colleague where they're saying that the efforts we've tried to help surrogates either with their predictive accuracy and reducing their burn just haven't worked. In fact, if anything, they've made things worse. And one of the problems I think is that what we try to do in these situations is that we try to make sure the surrogates understand and they have the right information Unfortunately, in these tragic situations, understanding and having the right 
information is to understand and recognize terrible things. Like you have a loved one who's very, very sick and has a chance of dying. And so repeating that and making sure that surrogates and loved ones understand it can just not surprisingly increase their anxiety and distress. And as Doug points out here at the end of this quote, maybe part of the problem here is we're, we're overlooking what makes the surrogate role so difficult. Although once we recognize that, what we can do about that, I think isn't exactly clear. Okay, so a number of efforts to try to increase predictive accuracy and or reduce burden, we haven't been doing very well. So I'm just gonna very briefly talk about the research we've been doing over the last 10 to 15 years in this area. This is very much ongoing. We don't know if it's gonna work or not, but the things we're working on, I just thought I would briefly mention. So this is based on an idea that we've known for a long time, which is basically that patient's treatment preferences are correlated with a number of different characteristics of the patients themselves. So just to give an obvious example, there are a lot of different ones, but a really intuitive, clear example here is that there's an inverse correlation. The older a person is, the less inclined they are to want aggressive treatment. So if you give a scenario where somebody needs to be in an ICU for a couple of months in order to survive and go on living, 25-year-olds will basically all want it. 50-year-olds might start wavering, 70-year-olds, some will drop off, and 85-year-olds, a lot of them will say it's not worth it. So just an intuitive and obvious correlation. And so our thought was, well, if we could gather up all of these predictors, we'd have to find out which ones they're actually out there. But if we could identify them and harness them, we might be able to create a computer-based algorithm that would help predict the treatment preferences of individual patients in actual circumstances. So that's the idea of what we call patient preference predictor. So the idea is to try to gather up information about what patients with the characteristics of the patient in front of us want. That information might be supplemented depending upon how well we're able to do with things like electronic health records, supplemented by information about the patient themselves. For instance, what decisions have they made in the past? What treatments have they accepted? Are there any treatments that they've declined? And there's at least some reason to believe, although we're gonna have, this was just a very preliminary PPP that we tested this with, but that test of a very preliminary one suggested that using a PPP would be as accurate as surrogates. And then our thought was that preliminary PPP included only a very small number of predictors. And it suggested that at least in theory, if we could include more of the predictors, we could gather more of the predictors and build them in to the PPP. At least in theory, there's the potential that that process might be more accurate in terms of predicting what treatments patients want than the surrogates alone were able to predict. So this could be implemented in a number of different ways. One is we just call the informational approach. You could have the surrogate or the loved ones and the clinician could enter all the information for the patient, find out the prediction, and then just give that prediction to the family and let them do with it what they will. They could just say, well, according to our model, according to our algorithm, it suggests that your loved one would want dialysis or wouldn't want intubation, whatever the prediction is. Another one is what called the soft default. So the idea is here is that what the clinicians could do is they could explain what the PPTP prediction is. And then they could say, okay, we're thinking about doing this. So we're going to intubate or we're not going to intubate again whatever the prediction is, and then say, okay, we're gonna go with this, but do you have any objections or concerns or see any problems with that? And the thought there is maybe what that would do, if that would work, is that it would keep the family, the surrogate involved. So if they had objections, for instance, they were confident the patient would want something else, they could let the clinicians know. And if they didn't know, then they could just go along with that default. And at least in principle, the thought is that it might thereby help to decrease the decisional burden on the surrogates because in a sense then they're just acceding to the decision of the PPP rather than actually making the decision and then maybe feeling responsible for it themselves. So what we know is we know a good deal of the negative impact that we mentioned before of surrogate burden traces to not knowing the patient's treatment preferences and therefore feeling responsible 
for making the decisions themselves. And so that suggests, at least in theory, if a PPP is able to increase predictive accuracy, it may also reduce surrogate burden. Now, this is all just in principle at this point. And so what we're going to need is we're going to need future research to test this out and see whether or not it really works in practice. And those are the next steps we're working on right now. Okay, so finally, I just want to mention a couple things. Okay, so what I've said so far is that we have certain goals for surrogate decision making with respect to decisionally incapacitated patients. We're not achieving those goals nearly to the extent that we would hope to do number of efforts to try to improve things haven't worked. Things we're working on are still in the pipeline. So what can we do now? What can clinicians do to try to hopefully make things at least incrementally better? So I think there are a couple of things. So one is, obviously people have mentioned this for a while. So if you have a patient or if their patients or loved ones who have very strong treatment preferences in one way or another, it's important to discuss those and document those. Also, most advanced directives focus on treatment preferences. I do want dialysis. I don't want blood transfusion. It also can be important to talk about process preferences. How do you want decisions to be made for you? Who do you want those decisions to be made by? And one of the other things people talk about in the literature is the concept of leeway. So if you have an advanced directive, to what extent do you want your surrogate to follow your advanced directive to the letter? And to what extent do you want your surrogate to have leeway to use their own judgment based on their understanding of the specific circumstances to make the decision that they think is best? And those are all things that patients and the surrogate could discuss ahead of time. And the patient, to the extent that they have strong preferences, could document those things. Choosing a surrogate. So a lot of people, the data suggests over 90% of people just choose their next of kin. They choose their child. They choose their spouse. Maybe that's the right way to go. But at least one thing to consider is, as Doug White had mentioned, what the role and the demands of being a surrogate involve, and then try to figure out who would be best for filling that role or who would best be able to handle those burns. So processing complex information, handling stress, being in a clinical environment, being comfortable with the responsibility of making decisions. That might point to one surrogate, say one child, one brother over another. As I always said, is supporting surrogates. It's really important. I always harken back to the Dan Brock Allen Buchanan point Surrogates aren't just channels. They're actually people, they're loved ones, they have interests, they have concerns. And so trying to really figure out ways to recognize the challenges they face and support them. One of the important things here is don't dwell too much on negative effects. Don't keep reiterating how sick the patient is or the chances the patient's gonna die. Also, again, don't treat them as channels. What are their concerns, their fears? What are their goals? And this is a really interesting paper. We have some data suggesting this might be true too, where we assume what surrogates are gonna be doing is substituted judgment. Turns out that at least some surrogates aren't doing that. We just finished a qualitative study we did with a number of surrogates and we were asking them what they thought of the PPP, our approach that I had described a minute ago. Most of them liked it, but there was a minority who, were, who thought it was a terrible idea. And when we pushed them on why they didn't like it, it turns out that they just rejected substituted judgment entirely. They thought, look, you're leaving this up to me. I'm taking responsibility for making these decisions. Then I'm going to decide how to do it. It's not up to the patient. I'm the decider now. I think that's really interesting. We don't know how prevalent that is among surrogates, but it's something worth finding out. And it's also related to what I mentioned before about the extent to which patients have process preferences, like they want their surrogate to be making substitute judgment determinations, then those things should be discussed ahead of time to make sure the surrogate and the patient are on the same page. So how about making actual decisions? So one of the things is to try to help. Sometimes this can be clarifying. What was the patient like? What were their goals? What did they care about? Were they risk takers or were they not? Kind of in line with the idea of the PPP, if you have a sense for what similar patients tend to want, similar patients, I've had lots of patients like this. In these cases, they have all wanted dialysis or not wanted dialysis, or most of them have wanted to be intubated or not. What similar patients want can be predictive of what the patient in front of you wants. Another thing that's important, it's hard to know exactly what to do with it, 
but it's important to note from all the data that confidence in what the patient wants really has a very minimizing effect with respect to psychological distress. So the more confident the surrogate is, yeah, I know my dad wouldn't want to be intubated. Now, of course, they might be wrong about that, but the confidence itself can be protective of distress in the surrogate. And so if you're going to probe the extent to which the surrogate's right about that, it's good to do it in a way that tries not to undermine that confidence given how protective it can be. And again, trying to avoid senses of responsibility to the extent that that's possible. And then involving the patient, not all patients who have decisional incapacity are unconscious like the one I've been imagining to the extent that they can be involved, encourage the surrogate to involve the patient to the extent that they can explain options to them, solicit their preferences. This is wording that comes from the research setting, but talks about getting the positive agreement, what's called the assent of the patient to the extent that they're able to give it. And also obviously addressing any signs of distress, any signs of distent, dissent. Even patients who have decisional incapacity are typically the best judges of what their experiences are like, what dialysis is like for them, what intubation is like for them. And so still listen to them. And that can be really important means for promoting their interests, even after they lose decisional capacity. Okay. So just summing up a little bit here, many patients, particularly older patients and patients at the end of life, I like to say that probably many, maybe the majority of the most important medical decisions are made by somebody other than the patient. So that all the emphasis on patient autonomy is important, but we have to recognize is that it doesn't apply to a lot of patients. Also important to know that they're surrogates, the, the designated and next of kin surrogates that we currently rely on, they're often not able to predict the patient's own preferences, and they frequently experience distress even to the level of trauma when making decisions for decisionally incapacitated patients. So it's trying to help them minimize that burden, reduce some of that decisional responsibility to the extent possible, try to involve the patient when that's possible. And hopefully we're gonna figure out ways to do this better as we go along. Okay, so thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dave. That was, um, I'm sure thought, thought provoking and question provoking. So we, I'm sure we'll, we will have a few questions coming in. I see um, there's one in the chat actually, and um, others are welcome to either, as you said, raise a hand or um, do a Q and A. Um, we do have a couple of hands raised. Let me take the question in the chat first, if that's okay. And, and if you need more explanation, I'm sure we can get it. But um, it's, the question is, how do you integrate notions of ineffective care into the discussions and decision making. So um, I'm assuming that's referencing the the PPP approach, but I'm not entirely sure. But maybe, yeah, maybe you can take a stab at that. If okay, let me take a stab at it, and then the yeah. question: of Feel free to come back. So, yeah. what I was thinking is that, well, here, here's the, here's the way I'm 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 understanding that, which which may not be the way it was intended. So feel free to correct me, but. But one of the approaches that people think about here is to think about what treatments we even offer in the first place. We have somebody's decisionally incapacitated. Maybe they're at the end of life. They're very sick. Does it make sense to offer them dialysis? Does it make sense to offer them intubation? Are those treatments that even should be offered? Are they ineffective treatments that we shouldn't even have on the table in the... Um, in the first place. And so some people might know this, the way I'm thinking about this is there was a large literature on this a little while back on what was called futility at the time. And the idea there was if we could identify treatments that just were futile, then we didn't have to offer them at all. The problem with that approach is that while we can think, okay, the chances of certain treatments are gonna work are low, very low, minuscule, it's almost impossible to identify treatments where you can say with confidence, there's just no chance that this is gonna help a particular patient. And so the result of that most people think, and this was what most people took to be the result of the futility discussion was you really have to know the values and the goals of the particular patient and the circumstances. So you can know the chances are really low, you can't know they're zero. And so you have to know whether or not it makes sense in this patient to give it a try. 
Um, Khadija, let me um, bring you on here so that you can ask your question. Go ahead, please. Hi there, can you hear me? Hear yep. you loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for the uh, thought pro thought provoking talk. Um, I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about um, how uh, different marginalized uh, social groups are come into play here. So thinking about women, racial and ethnic minority groups, disabled persons, um, how considerations of our social hier hierarchies come into both the design of the PPP as well as the implementation of the PPP. Right, right. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. So it's interesting. Um, so we first developed the PPP and we presented, so I was just, just presenting it in, in principle to people. This was one of the biggest concerns that we regularly got. It was a concern about, and, and there were, tell me what you were thinking, but that, that people voiced at least two kinds of concerns. The first concern had to do with a level of trust. And so the thought was, this is a kind of fancy computer-based artificial intelligence approach. And maybe people from marginalized communities are going to be less trusting of those approaches. They're going to be more worried about it. Um, I think that was one concern. The second concern, as we mentioned, is that the way the thing would be built or part of the way it would be built is you'd find out what the preferences were of a whole group of patients and then you'd apply those preferences to the specific patient. And so the accuracy for various groups is going to depend critically on who you get the data from in the first place. And so let me just take those two. It turns out, interestingly, after we got those concerns, we've done two kinds of surveys, which I could discuss in about 1,500 uh, patients and surrogates. And what we found out is actually, for the most part, at least the people we've talked to from marginalized communities tend to be more supportive of the PPP than people who are not. So basically, I think what we found in summary is that people from marginalized communities they feel like, okay, they recognize in a lot of cases they're from marginalized community. They feel that marginalization in their lives in various ways already. And so what I found, which I found gratifying is a lot of people felt that this was possibly a means for addressing those effects. If what, instead of just getting, oh, what the views of some fancy doctor thinks about what my mom's gonna want, we're gonna get data on what people like my mom actually want and we're gonna base decisions on that. So in theory, at least they were very supportive. The worry obviously, Shum, I think is in terms of, we know this with machine learning in general, we've gotta make sure we have representative people on whom we build the PPP. And then I think as important is that we're gonna to have to have a means for implementing it in a way that people are trusting of. So what the biggest worry people had with the PPP was they were worried that, well, some for-profit entity is gonna take control of this and then they're gonna use it as a way just to deny expensive healthcare to my mom or my loved ones by saying, oh yeah, no, our computer, it turns out, predicts she wouldn't want this. And so they just get to save money. And so I think that for me is one of the real concerns with it. And it just points critically to, now we don't even know if it will work. So it might just be a moot point, but if it does work and we ever get to implement it, we're gonna have to make sure we do it in a way that the people who oversee it are trustworthy, that there's transparency in both the development of it and in the implementation of it. I think those things are just gonna be absolutely critical for addressing these concerns that I think, as you point out, are really important. You wanna follow up at all, Khadija? Or... Um, just the, yeah, that was super helpful. I think the one thing that I would add or just two things that I was thinking about, yes, I, I definitely agree that the representative data sets are key, but I think it's also important in addition to um, representativeness of the data is to uh, sort of do, do a, a, a deeper dive into um, the way that those processes of social marginalization are um, embedded in data, even in representative data. So for example, 
um, if you're mining data about preferences of a certain group uh, or, or, or of individuals based on you know what they have done, um, it would be interesting again and you know to look at okay did someone make this decision let's say from a marginalized group um, sort of fully autonomously right or were there things like um, you know, evidence of clinicians doubting people of color, for example, about their symptoms and things like that, and these other processes that might um, influence data that even that might be representative in terms of numbers, right, to sort of do a little bit of a, a deeper dive into um, how those processes are, are represented in the data, and then sort of related to the um, implementation piece, right, I think it's really important to, um, and encouraging to hear that there is kind of um, excitement and and trust from uh, patients and their surrogates from marginalized groups about this tool, but there's also the piece of you know cl clinicians as well, and again, um, evidence of you know clinicians kind of expressing doubt um, uh, about marginalized patients and and their conditions and even their surrogates. So just imagining a, a kind of uh, scenario where someone the PPP returns a certain result, the surrogate says, no, we don't trust that, does, you know, how much, and if that person is from a marginalized group, right, how much um, weight is their um, uh, objection given or, right, like what kind of happens in that, in that process um, yep. when the tool is being implemented. So thanks. Very important. Thank you. All right, well, you have a, a, another uh, queue of questions here. So let me um, bring Nancy Cass on and uh, allow Nancy to talk. So Nancy, I think you should be able to unmute if you'd like. Thanks. Okay. Oh, we heard you for a second, Nancy, and then you went Sorry, back. sorry, my, my, my thing popped up in a funny way. Dave, first of all, thank you. This was such a great talk and you are so clear. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. I, I have um, I have two questions, but maybe since there's a queue, I'll just ask one of them. I, I was thinking in listening to you that um, given that there is this, uh, what I will call assumed privileging of autonomy and of trying to identify what were any stated prior preferences of patients around what become these tough decisions about dialysis or intubation or something else, it, it seems to me that there is this built-in assumption that if only we knew, there, there would have been a clear decision. And I think something that in this whole narrative is often not acknowledged is that I think it's often really hard for the surrogate, not because they didn't necessarily know what the patient thought or what their values were, because, but because it's genuinely a really hard decision for which there isn't a clear right answer. And that the patient, if they were fully cognizant, also would have found this a vexing, hard decision. And I raise that because I think sometimes there is additional moral distress on the surrogate because the pressure on them is what would the person have decided if only we could look at that envelope, there is an answer. But I think sometimes there isn't an answer. I mean, I think we've all been through so many situations with loved ones who are fully cognizant, who have a really, really, really hard time making a decision. And we all agree, yeah, that's a hard one. I don't know what I would do. So I just want to throw that in that, that we, can, we can do our best to respect autonomy and try to understand what were the stated preferences or values. But, but I think the more we somehow frame discussions as if there is somewhere an answer that the patient would have clearly given, it, it might or might not, it might not be accurate. Yeah. Yeah, Nancy, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I agree. Let me just say a, a couple things that hopefully are helpful. One is I, I mentioned our sort of endorsed life approach. And the idea there is when you're faced with these circumstances, you should try to ask which of the options would best continue the life that the patient endorsed for themselves? I think philosophically that is the right way to do it, but I think you're exactly right that a lot of cases in which it's just, there's no definitive answer to that question, that, that the life the patient endorsed for themselves is consistent with either of them, or it's not clear which it's consistent with. And even if the patient themselves were here with us fully capacity right now, they'd say the same thing, as you're saying. They're like, I don't know what I would do in that case. And I think a lot of these cases are like that. I think part of it is just this 
specific reason that a lot of them come down to statistics. The chances of benefit are really, really small. Well, where are thresholds for when a chance of benefit is too low? No, none of us have it in our heads. Well, I'll take a 1%, but not half a percent, right? We just decide at the time. So I think you're right that a lot of times there isn't a definitive answer. And in a sense, pretending that there is might put more burden on the surrogate than otherwise. And so I think the question then is, what do we do about that? So here's one thing I think sometimes is maybe what we should do is we should rethink all of this and what we've been doing and what I've been doing and everybody else who works in this field has been doing is thinking, okay, these decisions are really important. And so we got to get it right. Well, maybe that's the mistake. And what we should do instead is somehow try to downplay the importance of these decisions and realize that, you know, we're almost just making it up for ourselves anyway. So maybe we should try to de-stress these circumstances in a way. And in theory, I think that's a good idea. But I don't know if you have thoughts. We I love time sometimes, but I just can't figure out how to do that, you know, because in a sense, we don't know what the right decision. Maybe the patient would know themselves. But these really are decisions about living and dying. And so in that way, they're critical. Well, some of my colleagues say, yeah, patient wouldn't known anyway, so just leave it up to the family. My worry is the data suggests that the more you just leave it up to the family, so you just decide based on what's best for you, the worse that's going to be for the family, because then they're really going to feel like they're responsible for the suffering and the death of their loved ones. And that's the last thing we want. So and in a sense, I agree with you, but I'm not sure exactly where it points us. And I think that's going to take more thought. Great. Um, thank you, Nancy. I think in the interest of time, we'll then go forward with our next um, question. And that's going to be Travis Reeder. And we're not going to have a ton of time for more questions, I'm afraid. So if others want to ask a question, please feel free to type it in the chat so we can capture it for Dave. Uh, thanks, Travis. Yeah, thanks, Joe, and thanks, Dave. Um, I'm with Nancy. I was both just really gratified to, to listen to this, and I had a very similar question, but since you got some of the explanatory stuff out of the way, it helped me think a little bit more. Um, so here's here's one sort of response to your your question back to Nancy. So I had the same question. I was just like, this feels like this feels like a project that, that makes me really uncomfortable because it's, it's looking for a right answer of a kind that there just isn't. You know, it's like, it's treating it like an epistemic project when it's a practical project. If you unseal the envelope, there's an answer. There's a correct answer. I and mean, we're just better or epistemic agents. So, I mean, have you thought about or, or does anybody else in the field talk about just, well, part of the reframing we could do is to just be explicit about the fact that it's a practical, not an epistemic project because I actually despite all that I don't have any problems with the PPP um, and you know it sounds like hey information can be helpful for, pe for people so so great but the framing of it does seem to contribute to telling surrogates or or people trying to make the decision that it's an epistemic project and then they have to get it right so could part of the response that you were asking for just be you know um, making more explicit that it's a practical project and maybe collecting some other data, but the data is on how many people, in fact, <laughs> find it really difficult to think about the idea that there's a right answer. So I, I, I'm just going to ramble if I say any more. So I'll stop there. But but thanks again. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. We'd love to talk this for more. So so first, we're running out of time. But I just want to clarify. We, have, we I think we have to we'll have to talk more about when we say whether or not there is or isn't a right answer. What we mean there, because in one sense there is a right answer. If the patient were in these circumstances, the patient, in fact, would make a decision. So the extent you think about this in terms of standard, traditional substitute judgment, there is a right answer. It's the decision the patient would have made because patients do make these decisions in the end. So I think in that sense, at that level, there is a right answer. Now, as Nancy and I were saying, there might not be a right answer in terms of something slightly different, which is which of the choices best promotes authenticity or the values and the fundamental commitments of the patient. There might not be a right answer there. Now, the problem, though, is what we have is someone's got to make the decision. And the problem here is that when you make that decision, you take on the responsibility for the outcome, at least to a certain extent. And Although it's hard for us to make decisions for ourselves, we know how to do that and we can take responsibility 
for our own decisions. But making life and death decisions for somebody else is really hard. And what the data show us in a lot of cases, it's a really terrible situation to put somebody in. And it's the loved ones we have to worry about. Here's, just, sorry, I'm running out, we're running out of time. This is great stuff, we could go on forever. Um, just to say, well, here's a different, you're, look, look, Dave, what you're saying, you can't rely on the patient, the patient's values aren't gonna be determinative. And you just maybe convinced us or gave reasons why we don't want to just rely on the family on their own. That's going to put more burden on them. Maybe we should move it away from the family too. And what some people think is, oh, let's take on social considerations and do this based on costs or rationing or things like that. That's a very rational approach, but I don't know what, this is just your speculation. What you think would happen if we went out and told all patients, here's how we're going to make decisions for you now when you lose capacity, we're going to decide it based on social consideration i just wouldn't i mean i think the nicest way to say it, just can't imagine it would fly revolt is the is the nastier term i had in mind all right well with that dave i think we'll just have to thank you um and I'm, I'm, i hate leaving questions on the table but um really really interesting obviously stimulating talk um and um i hope colleagues will follow up if they do want yeah and and to just tell people you know i'm I'm around, I have email, I look at my email. So if there's something Great. you really like to chat about or question, feel free to email me. Great, thanks so much. And All right. thanks everyone for joining today. Thanks for the great questions and thanks for your help, Joe. All right, take care. Bye-bye everybody.